have your Bible, turn it to Joshua, the third chapter. We're going to be continuing a series that we started last week called The Past and the Promise. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, I'm aware of the fact that I have a past. But you need to know that I also have a promise. You need to say it like you mean it. I know I got a past, but I also have a promise. And the things that God has wanted to take you into... Your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard, it has not even entered into your imagination the things that God has prepared for you. He's got some good stuff. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's got some good stuff. stuff. Now turn to the person on your other side who's your second choice say, "Uh, he's got some good stuff for you too. (laughs) And so (laughs) in this series we've been dealing with the and that is in between the past and the promise. There's a space there. And how we deal with the and will determine how we step into the promise. And so in Joshua, the third chapter, we are looking at the moment in time where Joshua is about to lead Israel over the Jordan River into the land that God had promised them. For 40 years now, they've been wandering around in the wilderness, stuck. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before. Have you ever felt stuck before? That's a miserable feeling. My, my wife and I, several years ago, we were going to fly to Denver, Colorado. And I get, at the, I get to the airport two hours early, okay? Now it's around four hours early. Because I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but my name is R.M. Meshagan. They're going to pat you down with that kind of name. <laughs> and it's even worse when you travel with my dad. They take you to the special room. <laughs> but, so I get there early enough, and so my wife and I would get there. We're all checked in, all of our baggage is taken care of, and I'm like, hey, we got time, let's go to P.F. Chang's. And so we go to P.F. Chang's, and we eat, the, we eat the lettuce wraps. If you're not aware of the lettuce wraps at P.F. Chang's, now you are. You are welcome. Go try it. And so we, we went and ate some food, and then when we left, we had plenty of time before the plane boarded. So we're just meandering through the airport, checking out the shops, checking out the newsstands, you know, getting the little nicky knackies that you may need on the flight. Who knows what's, you know, you don't never know what you're going to need. And so we're just looking around, and they start calling uh, the zones. And so I'm like, to my wife, I'm like, let's just wait till the end. That way we're not sitting just on the airplane. Like, let's enjoy some space while we got it, because this flight's going to be around three and a half hours. And so we wait, and finally everybody's bored. And so I'm like, now is our moment. Now is our time. And so we, we go to get on the plane, and they said, sorry, we gave your ticket away. That's exactly what I was thinking. (laughs) Your response was a lot kinder than mine. (laughs) I wasn't aware of the fact that they could give your ticket away when you didn't get on the plane when they thought you should get on the plane. And so because of this, now my wife and I are stuck at the airport. We're not where we were. We're no longer at home, but we're not where we want to be. We're in this place of just being stuck and that's a helpless feeling and sometimes we can feel that way in marriage we can feel that way in finances and and just sometimes in life in general we feel stuck and and so that's what's going on with Israel for 40 years they've been stuck but we're going to see how God brings them through that place of wandering around into the promised land and from it we're going to learn how we can get from where we are to where God has called us to be and if you are not stuck right now you probably have been stuck before. And if you've never been stuck before and you're not stuck right now, there's probably going to come a time in your future that you will be stuck. So you can use this as a break open in case of emergency message, okay? You can just file it around for emergency use only. So Joshua, the third chapter, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim. You do not want to stutter when you get to that part of the Bible. The majority of my study time is focused on making sure I get past that one sentence. Now that we're there, I'm home free. And they came to the Jordan, (laughs) he and all the people of Israel, and they lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place to follow it. Now, now, the Ark of the Covenant was God's presence on earth at that time. 
We, we understand now that we're in the new covenant, God's presence dwells inside of us. But at that time, the Ark of the Covenant was where the presence of the Lord was. And what the commanders are telling the people is, you need to wait for the presence of God to move before you move. See, sometimes we jump into what we think is a promise too soon. And it's important that we understand that timing is everything. Tell the person next to you, timing is everything. I've got to make sure that if God is wanting to stay here right now, that I stay here right now and I don't move until I see him move. It's very important if I'm going to navigate through this life and walk in success and walk into the things that he has designed for me that I stay very close to his presence. And so they tell him, you got to wait until you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God being carried by the Levitical Levitical priest. Then you shall set out from the place and follow it. Verse 4. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. God is wanting to take you somewhere that you have never been before. God desires to take your marriage to a place that has never been before. I don't care how good it may seem right now, there's always better. Do you understand that? There is always better when it comes to God. There is always more. There's more joy. There's more peace. There's more success. Everything that we need, there is more in him. And so God God is telling the people, I'm about to take you somewhere that you have never been before. But in order for you to get there, there's got to be a transition. Before you can occupy the promises of God, there will always have to be a transition. And this is where it gets a little bit bothersome to us because a lot of us don't like change. We like things to be the way they are. We like things to be in a pattern that we can follow. But in order for us to step into something new, we have to transition from the old. Are you following me? We've got to be willing to break some of the patterns that have kept us stuck. Sometimes we get stuck in a cycle of family history, family drama, things that are passed down from generation to generation. We get stuck there. And if we're going to break through and step into something new, we have to learn how to transition well because you can never occupy the promise unless you first transition how many of you have ever seen that to be true in your life I can't tell you how many times in my personal life God has transitioned me so that he could move me where I needed to be sometimes I moved willingly and sometimes I moved kicking and screaming and here's what you need to learn about God God will get you where you need to be whether it's willingly or kicking and screaming. And it is much easier to get there willingly than it is kicking and screaming. God intended for Israel to move into the promised land. This is a promise that he gave hundreds of years prior to this moment to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to increase your family, and I've got some land for you. And there you're going to prosper and succeed. Now we get to the children of Israel. They've been in bondage. In slavery for 400 years, Moses leads them out of that bondage and slavery, but watch what happens. They get out of their bondage and slavery. God says, now it's time to go into the promised land, and because they're not willing to deal with the stuff they need to deal with in the moment, it delays the going in. 40 years, wandering around, going in circles. I wonder sometimes how many times I'm going in circles or beating my head against the wall in a certain situation because I just wasn't willing to go when God said go. And God will work on you. God will work on you to get you where you need to be. So there's four things that I want to hit today that, that keep us from transitioning. The first thing is this. You're not willing to fight the battle that needs to be fought. You're not willing to fight the battle that needs to be fought. Before 
you ever walk into a blessing of God, there's going to be a battle. And your willingness to fight the battle that needs to be fought will determine when and how you step into the promise. The reason that they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years is because when they come up to the place that God tells them to go in, they are intimidated by the enemy they see in front of them. They see this enemy as giants, and they say about themselves, we seem to ourselves as grasshoppers in their sight. And because they were not willing to fight the battle, they didn't occupy the promise. And they had to wander for 40 years years. God said, I'm going to give you the victory, but you've got to show up to the battle line. Hear this, church. Victory belongs to you. Because of what Jesus Christ did, victory belongs to you. It is already yours, but you have to show up to the battle line. Many times, we want God to just drop things in our lap, and God does not work that way. God works this way. You do what you can do, then I'll step in and do what only I can do. But until you move, until you plan, until you prepare, you've made no room for me to do anything. As a matter of fact, you not showing up to the battle line is a lack of faith. You're saying, I don't trust that God will get me where he said I can go, and so I'm not willing to fight the battle. We, we know that we're stuck in this marriage situation that's not good, but we're not willing to do what it takes to have a marriage that's fulfilling. We know that our finances are stuck in a certain place, but we are not willing to do what it takes to step into the promise. Some of us, we need plastic surgery. And I'm not talking about the kind you get done on your face. You need to take some scissors to that plastic that you've got in your wallet and cut that thing up and say, God, I mean business. I am showing up to the battle line. I am going to fight this battle, and I believe that you are going to give me the victory. But if you never go to the battle, you'll never see the promise. And so many times we never see what God has for us because we are not willing to fight because we prefer what's convenient and easy. That's the way we're wired. We are wired for convenient and easy. The problem is convenient and easy will always snuff out success. And so if you want to transition, if you're serious about going from where you are right now to a new level in God, you've got to be serious about fighting the battles because there will be a battle before a blessing. I, I can't tell you about the battles that I've had to fight even this week, this morning. If I went through just some of the battles I had to fight this morning, but as soon as it came, I told Bob, I said, the fact that there is a battle, I know there's a blessing. I know that God's going to do something incredible today, and the enemy's trying to keep me from it. And the more intense the fight gets, the closer you are getting to victory. Never back off. Keep on moving. Hold your head up. Keep on swinging. Keep on fighting. And when you get knocked up, get back up. I love, I love the Rocky movies because this guy knew how to take a beating. And he would get pulverized and look like he had chopped liver hanging off his face. But no matter how many times Rocky got knocked down, he'd get back up and say, yo, I ain't heard no bell. I feel that for somebody this morning. I feel that for somebody this morning. You've, you've been knocked down, but it's time to get back up and say, I haven't heard the bell yet. I have not heard the bell yet. I am not giving up on where I am because I know that God has something for me. Debbie, there are times in your life that you've wanted to give up. There's times in your life you've wanted to walk away. There's times that you've thought, God, why this? But now you can see that God has something amazing in store for you. It's never over, is it, Debbie? It's never over. Tim, it's never over, is it? It's never over. As long as you are living and you've got a pulse in your body, there is something for you to accomplish. But you've got to be willing to transition. You've got to be willing to fight the battles. The, the, the next reason that people never transition, and this one is huge, is they have no vision. The Bible says in Proverbs the 29th chapter, verse 18, it says, where there is no prophetic vision. That means where there is no God-centered vision, 
the people cast off restraint. What that means is they wander around aimlessly. They do a lot, but they're not getting anywhere. It's almost like a hamster on the wheel. You're expending a lot of effort, but you're not really making it anywhere because you have no vision. Another translation says where there is no vision, the people perish. What that means is you die where you are because you can't see anything better. And you cannot live beyond what you can see. Turn to the person next to you and say, you'll never live beyond what you can see. I'm not talking about sight. See, sight deals with our senses. It's what I see in the natural. Vision is the picture that God has painted on the canvas of my heart. And so my sight may see one thing, but if I have a vision of something else, then I've got something I can move towards. Let's just go back to marriage. My marriage may look strained. My family may look like it's falling apart. There may be something in my life that seems this way, but if I have a vision for something better, I've got something I can move towards, but if I can't see it, I'll never go after it, and that's why so many of us live stuck where we are, because we don't see anything better. This is the way it's always been. This is the way my great-grandparents were, it's the way my grandparents were, it's the way my parents were, so it's the way I am. And that's why it is so easy for negative things to be passed down from generation to generation to generation because we never get a vision for anything better for our life. My dad was this way, and so I just accept that I'll be that way. I know a guy at 11 years old, he was locked up for the first time dealing drugs. 11 years old. He was a friend of the family, and my brother was talking to him one time when he he finally got out. And he told my brother, he said, my dad was a drug addict. My grandfather was a drug addict. He said, that's, that's all I know. That's what I, that's what I am. I'm a drug addict, and I can make money dealing drugs. That's all he could see. And because that's all he could see, that's where he lived. Because you'll never live beyond what you can see. Turn the person next to you and say, you've got to get a vision. You don't have to settle for where you are. Did you know that? You do not have to settle for where you are. If God says there is greater, then there is greater that you can move toward. And there can always be a shift. The Bible says that the old things are passed away. See, my past is gone. I can't stare at that anymore. Sometimes we never get a vision for the future because we're so busy staring at our past. Past mistakes. Past hurts. Do you know one thing that almost kept me from starting a church eight years ago? Looking at my past. More than my future. But I determined within myself, my past is my past. And instead of allowing it to crush me, I'm going to use it as a stepping stone that's going to launch me into my future. You've got to see more. You have to allow God to plant a God-sized vision in your life. And a God-sized vision has to be so big that it scares you. Because if you can do it on your own, you don't need God. So a God-sized vision is, This looks impossible, but I serve a God who specializes in making impossible things possible. I've got a vision. I'm moving forward. I'm not staying here any longer. There there may be a, a transitional season. See, sometimes we give up because it doesn't happen within the time that we thought it would. Or it doesn't work out the way we thought it would. That's why vision is so important because when things get cloudy around me and I can't see anything better with my natural eyes, I've got to have something on the inside that continues to live, that continues to drive me, that continues to move me, that continues to give me a reason to wake up in the morning. Vision. 
Vision, 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 vision. It's the difference between those that fail and those that succeed. So if you're not willing to fight a battle, you'll stay stuck. If you don't have a vision, you'll stay stuck. The next thing is this. Comfort kills transition. I wrote a pastor friend of mine this week, and I texted him that. Comfort kills transition. Comfort makes you feel like everything's okay even when it's not okay. The children of Israel, they get delivered from 400 years of slavery. But they were so accustomed to the way life used to be. As difficult as it was, they were comfortable there. And so the entire time they're in the wilderness where God is trying to take them into a land flowing with milk and honey, all they can do is think about the melons that used to be back in Egypt. All they could think about is where they came from because they were comfortable there. You know know what one of the the worst things invented for weight loss? Stretchy pants. (laughs) You know why? Because it makes you feel comfortable. You're not aware of your ever-growing surroundings. You feel okay. And so since you feel okay, you keep on growing and you're not even aware of what's going on. Why? Because comfort kills transition. If you want to lose some weight, go find that pair of pants that you can't wear anymore. Buckle them bad boys on. (laughs) Start walking around the house saying, I'm getting thin in Jesus' name. You'll never move into more if you're comfortable with what you got. Have you ever seen people, they get stuck in like a bad relationship because it's easier to stay than it is to move? They're more familiar with the way things are, and so they never move forward. That happens to so many of us in life. We get so comfortable. And it's not even necessarily that where we are is bad. But anytime we get comfortable, we cut off the transition that God is wanting to do in our life. That's why, like, as a church, I am so thankful for this building. I am so thankful for everything that God has done for us over the past eight and a half years. But I am not comfortable here. I am not comfortable here because I know there is more for us. As long as I'm alive and there are people out there that don't know about Jesus, I've still got something to do. And I've got to keep on moving. Amen? So turn to the person next to you and say, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. God works outside of your comfort zone. You didn't know that, did you? But God operates outside of your comfort zone because outside of your comfort zone is where you have to trust him. That's where faith comes alive. The final thing is this. You've got to change the way you think. Turn to the person next to you and say, change the way you think. I can't think the same thoughts I used to think and expect something new to happen in my life. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It's the same way with the way we think. If we want to step into something new, we have to alter the way we think. Israel was defeated before they ever fought a battle because of the way they thought. When they went in and saw the giants there, they thought, we're just like grasshoppers. We're going to get demolished, and because of the way they thought, they tucked tail and ran, and they had to wander in the wilderness. But what if they walked in and said, there's giants here, but right beyond those giants is milk and honey, and my God is bigger than them. See, it's all the way, it's all about the way you think. It's all about the way you look at the situation that you're going through. Can you find God in it? Can you find faith in the midst of what you're going through? Or are you stuck by the way you think? Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world. There's a pattern that the world follows. There's a pattern of thinking that the world relies on. And the Bible says, don't be conformed to that pattern. But be transformed, how? By the renewing of 
your mind. Every day I've got to allow God to renew my mind and change the way I think because the way I think will determine where I live. The Bible says it this way, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Take a moment just to ponder that statement. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's not as he actually is, it's as he thinks. If you think that you're garbage, you'll live like you're garbage. If you think that you're this way, you'll live that way and your actions will follow suit. There's something about us within our nature that wants to prove our point, even to our detriment. That's why some people, like, when they, when they come through addiction, they may break the addiction to where they're no longer using that substance. But if you talk to them, they don't say, many times, they don't say, I used to be an addict, but now I'm set free. What they say is, I'm an addict in recovery. You see that? That's the way they, that's the way they think. That's the way they see themselves. They see themselves still as a prisoner even though they're free. Israel was completely set free. When Moses took them out of Egypt, they were free, but they were still slaves in their mind. And it's easy for God to set you free and deliver you, but the challenging part is to allow him to get a hold of your mind and start changing the way you think so that you can become free indeed. I've got to start seeing things differently. I've got to start thinking about God differently. I've got to start thinking about myself in light of who God is and what he's done differently if I want to transition. And all of this transformation and transition that we talk about happens in the secret place. You, you know, a butterfly starts off as this little, oh, maybe a pupa, pupa, what is it, teachers in, in the room? It's just a little nothing, you know. It becomes a caterpillar. And it's got this life where it crawls around and it eats on the leaves. And it's a happy little life, I guess. But in order for it to grow wings to fly, it's got to hide itself in a cocoon. That's the secret place. For us, the secret place is the presence of God. If we want the things that I'm talking about, we've got to be willing to get along with God. We've got to be willing to get in his presence. We've got to allow his word to paint a picture on the canvas of our heart because that's where vision comes from. That's where my faith for the battles comes from. And the more time I spend with him, the stronger I get, the more faith I have. And so when I see an impossible situation, I say, today it becomes possible. I've been walking around all morning telling people, today is going to be a good day. Not because it looked like a good day when it got started, but I knew that this day is in God's hand. And I knew that God was going to do something for somebody today. And I believe that that somebody can be you. If you're watching at home, I believe that that somebody can be you today. Would you stand with me? With every head bowed, every eye closed in this place, if you heard what was being said today and you say, you know what, that, that's me. At this moment, there's, I know there's somewhere God is wanting to take me, but I feel stuck where I am. If that person is you, I just want you to lay your hand on your heart. And the first prayer I pray is I want to come into agreement with you. That God would meet you where you are. And that he would start the process of transitioning you. The process of bringing you from where you've been stuck and wandering into his promise. Father, for every person that is stuck today, 
we ask that you would move in a mighty and a powerful way to bring freedom. Father, we don't know how to do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. And God, that's why we lean into you. That's why we rely on you. That's why we trust you today. So Father, bring us to a new place today. Father, let us step into a new level of joy, a new level of peace, a new level of rest in your presence. Now, God, for every single person in this place, I ask that you would touch them. Lord, I ask that you would move in their heart and their life. Father, for those that don't know you or they've not fully put their trust in you, God, today I ask that you would begin to draw their heart close. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, if you've never received him as your savior, or maybe there was a time that you did, but you've walked away and you've grown cold, and that coldness has put you in a position where you're stuck. Today, I wanna give you an opportunity to rekindle that fire or ignite that fire for the first time. So if that person is you, I'm going to ask that everyone would say this prayer with us all across this room. Say, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you are my deliverer. Today, God, I'm asking that you would forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and make me new. Become the Lord and Savior of my life in Jesus' name. And everyone would say, Amen. Why don't you put your hands together and celebrate the work of God today? God, we love you, we praise you, we honor you, we thank you, Lord.